thank you, Johan, for that very kind uh, introduction. And uh, thank you to uh, the entire uh, Städelschule architecture class for inviting me to speak and for inviting me to teach the workshop. It's, again, <laughs> a pleasure and an honor. And I also want to thank the incredible group, so group of students that I'm working with in the workshop. Um, so last time I was here uh, to give a lecture, um, uh, that was an overview of the work that I've been doing in uh, our Stockholm-based practice, Norell Rode, over the last years. This evening's talk is going to be different in that it will look at how, how some of that work, upon reflection, suggests some more general and research-oriented possibilities. <clears throat> so, architecture has, of course, always operated between the grittiness of reality and abstract representations. Today, we find ourselves in a situation where the distinction between the, those two categories is being challenged. What I'm talking about can perhaps be exemplified by looking at Richard Linklater's movie w Waking Life. So Waking Life belongs to a genre known as docufiction, which is a fusion of documentary and fiction. Docufiction attempts to capture reality as it is, while at the same time introducing elements of stage, staged situations in order to heighten the experience of reality. So Waking Life was shot on a small budget and is characterized by a fusion of real actors and sites with digital animation. By creatively crossing the border between digital and the real, Linklater had found a way to combine the inconsistencies of and uncertainties of reality with the artific artificial nature and perfection of the digital. So here we see uh, as you probably have recognized already, Ethan Hawke and uh, Yuli Delpy. And I love the fact that if you, when, you, when watching this movie, it's not really possible to tell whether a certain object, uh, texture or color is an actual real thing that has been post-processed, or whether it has been added through digital animation. So rather than merely reinforcing the real, the movie freely moves between the real, the represented, the authentic, the mundane, the imaginary, and the fictional, and so on. So basically, in our practice, we're interested in this as an approach to architecture and to consider how architecture can come about by collecting, altering, and recombining snippets of the real. This is something that we have explored over a range of projects. Sometimes this can happen through a process of appropriation or repurposing of material, like in this early competition project for an art center in Cincinnati, where a, where a, a one-story warehouse in an abandoned neighborhood in, is extended with an additional story constructed from reused bricks sourced from adjacent buildings. So by collecting and sorting bricks according to color, uh, we designed a sort of flawed copy of the existing one-story facade of the warehouse that would be added on. Uh, almost as if we were trying to faithfully replicate the materials and order of the lower story, but with a completely different stock of materials at hand. This is a plan drawing from another uh, one of our first projects, a second prize winning competition entry for a redesign of a large park in a for a housing expo in Sweden. And here we propose to base the design on a detailed inventory of small existing landscape elements like trees, shrubs and rocks, so that these elements would start to shape the new footpaths that we designed through the area and that would start to snake their way around these landscape elements in order to form a network. So basically that the geometry of the paths would be hysterically sensitive to elements in the landscape that it would encounter. But since we didn't have access to a, such a detailed inventory of the landscape at the time of the design, we sort of faked it or invented it. And the first step was this uh, pixelated map uh, that you can see in a sequence uh, uh, on the right hand side of the slide that picked up contrasts between open landscape and areas of denser ve vegetation. 
and then randomly removing pixels that interfere with or that supposedly would interfere with landscape elements refines the map further and then finally the remaining pixels are turned into a mesh that retains details where relevant and smoothens them out elsewhere. And the line work that resulted from this process uh, loosely for formed the basis for the site's new infrastructure and those paths. <coughs> Sometimes it can be enough to just sample the geometry of certain recognizable formal features in order to create an effect. This is something that we did for a project for a commemoration in Warsaw, uh, Poland, sited in the park surrounding the Museum of the History of Polish Jews. So here we looked at typical domestic interiors in pre-war homes and designed an open-air monument where those interiors had sort of left an imprint. So almost as if rooms uh, in the apartments had been subtracted uh, from a solid block of concrete. So we gathered images of pre-war apartments from online databases and drew sections through articulations in floor, walls and ceilings to capture profiles of mouldings and wall panels and based the design of the, on those. <clears throat> So heightening the experience of reality can be about borrowing and amplifying forms from the immediate context of a site. Uh, like in our second prize winning proposal for the H.C. Anderson Museum in Odense, and of course, as many of you know, H.C. Anderson was a fairy tale author that uh, lived in Odense in Denmark. We designed the museum as a set of seven pavilions, uh, which you see here, and there are two additional. Actually, can you? Yeah, there are two additional buildings in in the in this lineup, and th that's the old house where H.C. Uh, Anderson was born, and then a, a, a rotunda that was erected in the 1920s. So a challenge in the project brief was to incorporate these historical buildings. Uh, uh, into a larger mu museum scheme. And we designed a group of pavilions that tweaked the proportions of familiar uh, roof forms and fenestration of the existing buildings. And here we see the group of pavilions with the ground pulled away and, uh, the, and you can see that they're connected with an underground gallery and then the typical king true form of um, these cute Danish houses. So what's real and physical in, uh, what's real in a certain physical and con cultural context is something, sometimes something remote. A couple of years ago we were in invited to design a small local space for commerce in a new neighborhood in Malmö in the south of Sweden. So we looked at uh, sharing economies and design a community market hall for goods that normally changes owners through online platforms like eBay and other uh, networks. So basically this was an attempt to make visible all the things that are sold including you know e everything from stuff that you would find in a flea market to cars or washing machines uh, uh, in an interior. And the dense ag agglomeration of wildly different objects and activities uh, create their own strange urbanism inside of the pavilion. Brought together, these colorful masses of objects produce a diverse urban landscape of compression and expansion. A pair of bookshelves suddenly define a narrow alley. Vacant spaces form short-lived miniature plazas and a plastic flamingo momentarily becomes a monument. As objects and activities come and go, the market becomes a living interior con continuously in flux. <clears throat> What's interesting also with, with um, uh, eBay and similar platforms in, in, in Sweden is that they're not at all um, just for uh, uh, crap or for cheap objects, but whole um, um, homes or um, cars or quite expensive and substantial goods can be sold through, the, through these platforms. <clears throat> this is an interior that we have designed for the Royal Institute of Art, uh, an art school on an island in the heart of Stockholm. 
It's a new home uh, for both students and faculty working with photography, video, multimedia and digital print. So there is a part in front here that um, is for discursive spaces, so things like seminar rooms, and then there is a part with um, project rooms, dark rooms, animation studios, and uh, a whole film studio in the back. And one of the premises for the project was that the building uh, uh, that the, the interior is in is a strange 300-year-old uh, navy building that started as a one-story building and then was added on to step by step. So initially it, would, it was just this part as a one-story building and then it has grown vertically. So for instance, this yellow um, row of columns and beams is something that was added uh, maybe 100 years after the first part was constructed uh, in order to support the floors above. So as a kind of context or as a, uh, um, an architecture that we could look at and sample from, this is a really uh, weird case because, you know, the fenestration in the facade, for instance, is not in sync with the columns in the interior. So what we did was to sort of copy and move elements around here a little bit inside of the interior to create interesting juxtapositions. So for instance, these windows are a copy of the windows in the facade to emphasize the kind of clash between the different order of the columns in the building. And there is a really interesting floor in the in interior here that has been patched up several times uh, uh, during the lifetime of the building that's, that's like a patchwork of wood, concrete and steel. This, this project is right now under construction so we're looking forward to finishing that um, sometime after the winter holidays. Before moving on to a more uh, thorough look at some of our more speculative or research oriented work, I also wanted to touch on work that we, I have done with students and colleagues at Chalmers in Gothenburg. A lot of this work is based on repurposing and reuse, often conceptualized through the lens of technologies such as uh, uh, photogrammetry. This seminar, for instance, focused on creating figures with a posture or gesture based on shapes created with primitives that were projected onto blocks of foam with a computer-controlled hot wire cutter. So focus was on transitions between uh, orthographic drawings on one hand and 3D massing on another hand and between form and color uh, or materiality. And where texture and color was controlled individually of geometry through projected images. This one is a series of student uh, projects uh, that, that has been looking at photogrammetry. And I'm showing this also, of course, because it's relevant to the workshop that we're doing. So as, as many of you know, uh, photogrammetry is a method in which many overlapping photographs of an object are processed in a software in order to produce a digital model of an object. The geometry of the object is typically captured in a point cloud as well as in a polygon mesh, while the texture and color of the object is captured in an image map that's mapped or wrapped around the geometry. So this is a scanned found brick from thesis project uh, last year. And I think what was interesting with this uh, uh, work was that it suggested a kind of new, conceptual, conceptualized uh, a, a view onto objects where that looked at the, ha the, the habit that you get through photogrammetry of separating between form on one hand and on color and texture on the other hand. So to the left here are like newly constructed bricks. That was just an intermediate step in the project, uh, but an interesting one where those are created through projection, orthogonal projection of image maps onto flat surfaces. <clears throat> so the project was about how those readings, recordings of a real chunk of material can be used as a basis for creating new forms and materialities that we see on the right hand side. So there were kind of two paths explored in the project where one path was to uh, through um, uh, milling construct a new materiality based on, on the texture map as a displacement map and then another one that looked at uh, 
a, a, a more graphic and uh, vector-based interpretation of the material acquired from photogrammetry. So the project was basically about how you can construct a materiality rather than take materiality for granted. This is more recent seminar work uh, that, that explored uh, how a building might be seen through photogrammetry. So what we did was to download models of iconic 20th century villa like the Gothmi house and fabricate models of them that were used as basis for scanning with photogrammetry. So the project playfully explored how um, mapped areas or spaces where the scanning could not see could be turned into design features or objects that were sort of um, uh, volumes uh, of, or blind spots uh, of the photogrammetry process. Several projects have also used uh, photogrammetry to survey objects uh, for the purposes of res of reuse. So in this project a couple of thesis students looked at um, recycled ocean plastic and how actual salvaged materials uh, and objects uh, could be documented with 3D scanning that would then form the basis of a design project. And the project included a workflow that that uh, started with cataloging, ma cataloging materials uh, uh, grinding them down or um, uh, uh, extracting smaller elements of them and then heating them and press forming them uh, uh, so that to get, to get construct new materialities or a new material identity that would partially inherit some of the rather than completely erase some of the uh, objects that it came from uh, and students referred to these sort of uh, elements that were more recognizable as um, fossils and that they constituted a kind of material memory of the objects that uh, they originated from. This thesis project uh, was a play with reality in the form of digital contextual information such as meshes and building masses uh, and Im image maps of facades that can be extracted from uh, 3D map applications like Google uh, Maps that architects n of course routinely use to survey sites. So, <clears throat> you know, just how often, uh, especially if you're working on a project remotely, that you don't, you, or if it's a competition, you don't go visit the site, you explore the site through uh, Google Street View and things like that, and that forms a kind of different analysis of a site than you can do if you were on site. The project ended up in a building design and a thesis about uh, what it means to be contextual in architecture when context is something that can be downloaded and tweaked, and again, Separate, uh, separated into meshes that uh, deal with form and uh, maps that deal with texture and color. And uh, you, well, the student, designed a series of facades that were sort of re remixed versions of facades of buildings on adjacent sites. So these projects, as well as the ones that I'm about to show, partially challenged uh, widely cited statement that architects do not make buildings, they make drawings of buildings. And the full quote by, uh, from Robin Evans reads, it would be foolish, it seems to me, to characterize architecture as abstract, since a house is no more abstract than a chair or a biscuit, but it makes a great deal of sense to call the process of its conception abstracted. Architects do not make buildings, they make drawings of buildings. <clears throat> this statement, made some 30 years ago, uh, has today become somewhat exhausted in the discipline. Although intended to target representation as a problem of translation from drawing to building, it can and has been used to perpetuate this distinction between drawing as a mainly conceptual pursuit that targets idealized geometry and building as a material pursuit that deals with the real world. <clears throat> the conception of architecture may, of course, still be abstracted in a certain sense, but it's, incre it's increasingly less abstracted. And it may, thanks to, for instance, things like photogrammetry and simulation, 
integrate the grit of the real world at the earliest stages of design. So in one of our first um, uh, projects in our practice, uh, which was an installation called the Rattic that we that was, by the way, also uh, um, um, the, the, the basis of a uh, research application that we won. We explored how material simulation transfers as aspects of real materials into drawings and models. So a drawing like this exhibits, uh, let's say, a tension between the erratic nature of a real piece of material and the abstracting powers of things like orthographic proje projection and section cuts. So the installation borrowed its name and its massing from the erratic block, a large boulder that has been tumbled by glacier ice. The installation consisted of a thick, pliable polyurethane surface, essentially like a large spheroid sack that was constrained in, hundred, in hundreds of points onto a rigid arm armature. And I think you can see the dots in the surface if you look closely. The sack was designed to be considerably larger than the armature so that plenty of excess material was left between each constraining point. The force exerted by the constraining points made the material, uh, made the surface bend, twist and furl in a seemingly random manner. So while the location of each point uh, could be designed and placed by us with precision, the resulting behavior of the surface was difficult, if not impossible, to predict. And the piece was designed by carefully placing the points, and in between the material had its way. And so far, the project seemed to be aligned with the conventional separation between representation and materialized design, so that some aspects of architecture can be designed, quantified, and represented let's say, before the event or before construction, for instance, through orthographic drawing, while others are dependent on real material manipulation and must be tested live. The work on Erratic took an interesting turn when we started using uh, material simulation uh, to simulate how uh, the sack would deform when it was manipulated. This was also a sort of necessary step in order to be able to quickly design massing variations of erratic boulders without producing time-consuming mock-ups. And these variations were studied in models and drawings that were exhibited along with the installation at the Alto University the Digital Design Laboratory <coughs> in Helsinki. And here is a, 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 a series of snapshots from a simulation uh, that shows the deformation of the sack uh, towards the shape of the installation. We also produced a series of section drawings. Um, and we thought that what was interesting with these drawings is that they do, don't describe the uh, curved geometry through the familiar language of radii or control points but that they instead target the discrete nature of the material by annotating the constraining points and the excess material that bunches up in them. So no, nothing is stretched or nothing is added or taken away. Instead, material is just redistributed uh, and, and uh, the geometry is measured as, an, as a redistribution of material <coughs> rather than as a, a tweaking of a topological surface, let's say. And to a certain extent, uh, this meant that we could predict the behavior of the material. Um, uh, in the software, the agency of the real world material coexisted with the Euclidean space of the armature drawing. Material agency could, su could suddenly be designed, quantified, as well as represented. And this was, and it's funny that you took that quote, Johan, because uh, that, that, that this is exactly that point. <laughs> that simulation in architecture challenges the typical separation between representation and materials, uh, materialized design, or between Euclidean space and the real world. As work pro progressed with the uh, project, it became increasingly important to fine-tune, at least to a certain extent, the relation between analog scale models and, and full-scale mock-ups on the one hand, and simulated models on the other. 
so of course we could tweak parameters with the simulation in order for it to conform to the uh, uh, real material but the other but tweaking also worked the other way in that because the uh, installation was constructed from foam rubber that comes in different densities and thicknesses, we could, in collaboration with our manufacturer, uh, change the properties of material to also better conform with the simulation. And this was sort of the second issue that the work seemed to prompt, uh, uh, that had to do with process and method and the creation of feedback loops between simulated geometry and real material. <coughs> And if you think about it, the, um, the typical habit of uh, on the drawing board or in modeling software to, you know, kind of call out or call forth virtual lines or surfaces that can be extended or uh, uh, trimmed or uh, stretched indefinitely is a very different, conceptually a very different starting point for design than actual chunks of materials or a limited stock of material. And this design in that case is no longer a, a, a product of imposing will onto formless and featureless matter. This would be akin to the uh, found object in art, uh, a chunk of material that derives its identity from the designation placed upon it by the designer as well as from its genesis in the real world. So the object or the material um, has a certain amount of resistance to the agency of designer and you might react or um, uh, you might react to that agency by subverting it or amplifying it, but, but not ignore it. Which also brings us to the next project. And this, uh, this take on agency of a material was something that we recently returned to in an installation that was part of this year's Architecture Biennale in Venice. The project, titled Grain Figures, was part of the exhibition Plots, Prints and Projections that was curated by Ulrika Karlsson. And it featured uh, large-scale uh, structures by six new uh, Swedish practices. The project was kind of a play on our ability as humans to perceive meaning in seemingly random data. Um, and the starting point of the project was to um, sort of mine the visual appearance of wood grain um, for familiar forms. So the visible grain in a piece of wood often appear as recognizable forms of patterns that are known in carpentry as grain figures. And the reason why carpenters want to um, identify those is both for visual purposes, but also for um, properties that they can uh, um, um, indicate in the material. So grain figures are commonly referred to as, for example, beer claws, crowns, bird eyes, burls, curls, fiddlebacks and quilts. And of course this phenomenon ties into aspects of pattern recognition even though the, 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 that recognition is carried out by humans. Um, and the features that can be seen in a sheet of uh, plywood uh, are a result of the process of producing the veneer that makes up the ply, uh, uh, which is a, a spiraling section uh, basically through a log that slices through knots and effects, defects in the wood that give rise to those patterns. <clears throat> so rather than departing from geometry and then let sort of let material fill out, fill out that geometry. We started with the material as a basis for drawings. <clears throat> and in a, in a very sort of quick and direct way by, uh, uh, we went ahead and, and uh, selected six sheets of pine plywood that were documented in high resolution photographs. And then we started like a, um, um, a charrette in the studio where we drew over those and where the lines that we drew would partially start to emphasize or respond to grain in the wood. <clears throat> and the, the carpenters that we collaborated with on the project, they really liked this because they say architects, they, architects love to go to you know, a marble quarry in Italy to select a specific sheet of marble for their uh, project, but when it comes to, to wood, architects are typically totally in, uh, uninterested and just says, use this type of wood. 
Um, so, uh, as you probably figured out already, we uh, drew these paths, and then they, these paths uh, became um, tool paths uh, for a CNC router in the carpentry, carpentry shop that were used to cut the sheets. Um, so the visible grain of a specific sheet of ply would start to guide the boundaries of the surfaces and break them down into layers. Lines separating one surface from another would suddenly go astray and wander along a meandering streak in the wood. <clears throat> and in this case the material became a kind of canvas for design, but not a blank canvas, let's say. And as, many, as, as in many of our other projects, context also played a role. So we looked at the glazing of the greenhouse uh, in Venice, uh, which was the site of the exhibition, and looked at its grid of mullions uh, in the glazing facade. <clears throat> and the way that the, the, the mullions and the grid start to interface with plant life. And uh, Rosalind Krauss once characterized the grid as being flattened, geometricized, ordered, anti-natural, anti-mimetic, and anti-real. And over several projects, we have become interested in grids, not necessarily as something that suggests infinity and dematerialization, but as something that focuses vision on the surface itself. Here is the installation in the Sara De Giardini greenhouse. <clears throat> so on a massing scale, the curves that we drew on top of the ply produce a set of figurative elevations that can be read as a fragment of a room or a facade, a silhouette of a mountain peak, or a map of a terrain, and we deliberately uh, kept ourselves from naming the, or uh, uh, labeling the installation as a piece of furniture or as a prototype for anything to keep those kind of interpretations open and uh, free-flowing. In the background, you can also see a glimpse of some of our uh, fellow uh, 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 practices that e exhibited in the show um, in interactive display by Swedish uh, practice Gran. And um, to the left, um, a housing prototype by Space Popular from London. Again, here is where the grid becomes an important as something that focuses vision and as something that one can measure the figures of the grain against, almost as we habitually do uh, with the grid in a modeling interface. Um, and other than the theme of plots, prints, and projections, and the focus on representation, the curator, Ulrika Karlsson, tasked all the participating architects to work with wood. And our take on that was sort of to look at a very artificial wood product like plywood and, and design, an, design something that would emphasize that artificiality even more. So last year we were commissioned by Arktes, the new National Center for Architecture and uh, Design in Stockholm, to design and develop another installation. This was for the first exhibition under the, new cent the center's new director, Kieran Long. And the exhibition gathered large-scale commissions, installations, and projects that all sort of um, tell stories about the struggle for public life. So basically projects that target how public space is changing at the moment with regards to politics, technological shifts, and social habits. The project that we de developed, titled Dead Ringers, explores what we refer to as a misfit between object and figure. It examines the role of small enclosed spaces in Stockholm's urban fabric, like phone booths, restroom kiosks, and photo booths. These types of spaces are, of course, uh, uh, becoming extinct because no one uses phone booths anymore. Uh, but little attention has been paid to that, at least in Stockholm. Um, uh, and so the project was basically a response to this tendency uh, uh, and in a, a response to the presence of these uh, iconic figurative architectural objects that are deeply ingrained in public consciousness among Stockholmers. <clears throat> uh, 
And what was, in, I think, what, 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 what we thought was really interesting with this as a small pieces of architecture was also that they're entirely shaped after, after the human body that they're meant to house, and that their silhouette suggests an almost human presence. The concept, with, the concept of misfit between object and figure can be explained in relation to artists Erwin Wurm's a Fat Car Sculpture series. And uh, I also have to admit that I'm a long-time fan of, of uh, Wurm's uh, work. So each fat car is essentially a life-size car that looks as if it's met if its metal plates have been inflated to the point where the whole thing is about to burst. As a mass, each sculpture is still easy rec easily recognizable as a car, and indeed even a particular model perhaps, but its finer formal features such as head and tail lights, license plates, etc., are almost lost behind heavy folds or fat. So we looked at uh, uh, an interview with Erwin Wurm um, that we thought revealed an interest in the fit or perhaps misfit between an object and its figure. Uh, so where the interviewer asked Wurm, so lurking behind all your fat cars are their real models? Precisely, you need the real car because the idea is to distort an existing shape. I have always been interested in finding a shape that negates the actual shape and is more like a uniform. So the amplification and certain, of certain morphological features in a fat car introduces a gap between the object and its figure. By scaling parts of its body out of proportion, Wurm calls attention to the anatomy of the car and by extension to its anthropomorphism. And beyond the obvious resemblance of headlights to a pair of eyes and the grill to a grin, this, allow, this may allow us to attribute human traits, such as personality and emo emotion and intention to it. So we started documenting the range of kiosks and booths in Stockholm based on photographs as well as archive drawings and then went on to design, so the, the, the white are all the existing kiosks and we went on to design a series of strange uh, copies of, of them shown here in black. And hence the name Dead Ringers. So each dead ringer would gain its appearance by selectively sampling the figural silhouettes of the existing booths. So each dead ringer combines different elevations from several of the originals so that new, slightly odd figures are formed. <clears throat> and the idea was that as you circulate around uh, one of these, you, you, different elevations would be revealed that slightly r remind uh, uh, you of one of the original booths. Uh, so that when you, when you move about, uh, 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 each object would sort of sustain visual interest over time. Uh, and so our dead ringers, like the original uh, ones, would be visible as more characters in the urban fabric, uh, but unlike their ideally proportioned forefathers, they would be disfigured, lopsided, and weirdly postured. <clears throat> and these are a series of elevations uh, of the same dead ringer that was later exhibited in the museum in Stockholm that draws from uh, uh, four kiosks, one from the 1980s, one from the 60s and one uh, from turn of the century. And here it also becomes apparent that uh, this thing with uh, uh, anthropomorphism and that uh, e the clear division of each kiosk into roof, uh, uh, body, and legs. Here are a few views from the exhibition that reveals um, the, uh, uh, these different elevations. And we'll, we were interested in, unlike the fact that in some uh, views, part of the overall form seems to fall into the projection plane of the facade and to suggest a sort of traditional frontality, but there are, whereas other parts of uh, 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 the geometry breaks out or twists out of that plane. So it's really a play between 2D elevation or frontality and the three-dimensional mass.
So one thing that we have been interested in uh, in, the, in the number of projects is how is to work with repurposed or appropriated objects or samples <coughs> that acquire a new significance when they are altered or removed from the, their original context. So here are just two references for that, and for those of you in, your, in the workshop, you already know this. Uh, the first is the ancient practice of spulia, where architectural elements used in construction in one location uh, in antiquity are repurposed and used in a different location, typically in the Middle Ages. <clears throat> and another one is a uh, contemporary example would be Greg Lynn's recycled toy furniture where plastic toys are repurposed, arranged and robotically cut to be fitted against each other. So this is a small uh, uh, conceptual project that we recently did uh, for a gallery exhibition in, in uh, south of Italy curated by uh, Giuseppe Resta. And uh, Giuseppe invited each uh, artist or architect to interpret one of Italo Calvino's invisible cities. And our interpretation was of the city of Clarice. Um, that's a city uh, uh, where uh, that's built and rebuilt again and again from the same stock of materials, basically. So the project began with a quick uh, scavenger hunt through our studio in Stockholm, where we looked for the smallest and sort of mo most beautiful objects, like material samples, pencil sharpeners, and other uh, uh, weird little things. This, uh, or, uh, this is an excerpt from Calvino's story about the city of Clarice. Uh, uh, I will just read it to you. Put together with odd bits of the useless Clarice, a survivor's Clarice was taking shape. All huts and ho hovels, festering sewers, rabbit cages. And yet, almost nothing was lost of Clarice's former splendor. It was all there, merely arranged in a different order, no less appropriate to the inhabitants' needs than it had been before. The capitals could have been in the chicken runs before they were in the temples. The marble urns could have been planted with basil before they were filled with dead bones. Only this was known for sure. A given number of objects is shifted within a given space, at times submerged by a quantity of new objects, at times worn out and not replaced. The rule is to shuffle them each time and then try to reassemble them. Um, so our idea with the uh, model was just that uh, when assembled, these found objects would complete the generic building in despair, bridging a new life uh, to the facade and to the city of Clarice. <coughs> um, the project, the, <coughs> excuse me, the, the, this project also ties into a larger research effort that we tentatively call the city as a material library. And it considers repurposing as a conceptual approach to architecture where the point of departure uh, is not abstract representation, but a specific and limited stock of objects and chunks of materials. Um, the project was also a kind of quick attempt to convey that repurposing in architecture is neither dystopic nor futuristic, and that can be a sort of playful fiction with immediate ties to the grit of the real world. <clears throat> and I thought I'd uh, finish off the lecture not with a conclusion, but by showing some images that we have uh, uh, taken from recent excursions uh, uh, we've been doing in Stockholm. And as part, of, as part of the research that I mentioned before, we have been documenting the life of objects and building elements of, after they have been dis disassembled or discarded. So we essentially tracked down and visited places where these kinds of objects and elements might go, ranging from warehouses uh, for used building parts to recycling stations and large uh, waste dumps. Some of the places that we visited were indeed like a library of sorts where one can browse for unique elements like doors or windows. And in some of these places like this one, there was, there's certainly a kind of romantic attitude that we, re that we can recognize from um, uh, uh, restoration and such practice and that fetishizes the kind of patina and signs of age. While at other places there was an, an attitude that was totally unromantic, like this warehouse with only used standardized building elements like 
you know, they would go on to a, 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 a demolishing site and, and source a uh, hundred standard steel doors, for instance. Um, the way in which these objects were sorted, arranged and stacked uh, also became almost architectural. Um, uh, and the way that one interprets the familiar building elements begins to shift when they are disengaged from the context of a building. Another set of visits took us to an enormous waste and recycling plant south of Stockholm. So this is where objects are sorted into uh, fractions, um, where, group, where waste is group, uh, grouped according to its properties. Uh, so for instance, this is a part where they handle uh, steel objects. Uh, and, and many of these places have an order of things all of their own. Uh, this is a fraction of plastic objects, um, uh, industrial products uh, next to domestic ice items. And where the, when in the random mess of the container, uh, adjacencies are formed between objects. And here uh, a, a large pile went wa waiting to be recycled uh, into sawdust that can be used for um, uh, particle board and stuff like that. And where the only thing that sort of guides these objects is gravity and friction. In some of the places where the, they are sorted and packed, to, uh, where materials are sorted and packed to be sold on the a sort of second hand market for recycled materials. Uh, they begin to suggest uh, masses, as uh, almost architectural masses, as well as new building materials. And I thought I end with this slide of uh, uh, the sort of urbanism of waste packaging bales. Um, so it's, for instance, things like pasta, cereal boxes, milk and juice cartons, sugar pouches and carrier bags, and gift wrapping. <coughs> And while waiting to be sold, the bales, the bales are stacked at the back of the recycling plant, and the stacking follows a pattern of blocks and streets uh, uh, that allows trucks to access and load the bales. And that's it. Of course. I mean, with, with regards to that research project that you're referring to, um, uh, um, the idea was that interiors are constantly in change as under, undergoing change as opposed to buildings which are fairly static because interiors contain loose objects, uh, furniture and other things that are constantly being rearranged. So that they, they are, interiors are, let's say, in flux much more than building envelopes that are static. And what would be the, and what is the particular interest in that? I mean, if architecture is static and here you are interested in space where it's so, so to speak animated by impulses of life, um, lives that, that imply reordering, Shuffling of the objects. So, is it the theatrical aspect, or is it the choreographic? Well, for the for the research, that's yet to be defined. But I think one thing that we're interested in is how the, those loose objects, uh, sort of in tandem with the architecture, with things like walls and floors, begin to structure space and su suggest space. And that sometimes even those loose objects are more important than uh, uh, the fixed ones in, in, in um, um, yeah, shaping space.
Because that, that leads me also to, because I was wondering about that. Is there, is, is there, is there an implied spatial project, do you think, in, in the work? I'm asking very specifically also because the, yours is a, a shared, and this obviously, you know, as, as well as anyone now, that it's also a, a shared fascination with sits here in this program is a fascination with objects and yeah I mean I uh, yeah, I mean, there is an implied spatial project, but perhaps that starts not with this, with the abstract space, but with objects instead. That I think there is a that's one of the habits that we have in architecture is to think of abstract space first and define it with lines or surfaces, and then think of objects and materials. Um, so that's one of the things that we um, want to explore in the project: how that process could be reversed or there could be an alternative approach. So your installation project, I can't remember the name of it, it's one way you actually gather, it's like a pavilion, you gather lots of objects that you... Um, Shuffle around, yeah. yeah. So that would actually be a, a sort of preliminary outline of also where the research project is going and it would embody the implied sort of curiosity about a spatial outcome. Yeah, definitely, but, but maybe where the, um, uh, because that product is a couple of years old, I think what, what was maybe a bit um, naive or not so exciting in, in that was that there was a total separation between the architecture was, that was just a framework and then the objects. I think that could be mediated more. <clears throat> In, in our defense, though, the, 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 the um, um, person in the office who built the models, uh, the, the model, um, she went on uh, constant excursions to uh, flea markets and secondhand shops to buy small used objects that could be placed in the model. Because <laughs> I mean, the, the, um, this was for an exhibition, that's why we made such a model. Um, so the the, the, um, the project was part of a larger effort in the city that also resulted in, a, in an exhibition. So the, the objects were actually um, used. Yeah. Because later, with, um, you showed the student project with the brick, and that was then used with photography, and then also you had this high resolution. So in your presentation, it would go like low resolution, high resolution, low resolution. So I'm wondering if that's uh, something you think about, or is relevant to question of resolution and scale of the system? I do think that it's definitely. I think it's definitely something we think about, but um, um, I'm not sure whether um, all projects sh must encompass that register. I'm more interested in the. In, in the body of work or a series of projects that target different aspects of those. So of course, there could be like a, um, 
like a grand final project that explores all of those registers in one. Um, I think ba ba that was basically because our interest changed a little bit from from thinking about material agency as something that has to do with how you can bend or uh, how a material would react to pressure to thinking about material agency also as something that has to do with image or representation. That, that it's not that the image of mat the material has any less agency than the, the, the physical properties of the material. Yeah. Or anything that loses, that would, you, would you say you treat a brand new object or a brand new idea in the same way? That um, works What do you mean treat? Like would you consider it for, a, for one of these uh, exercises or these series of projects that you do? Like I'm yeah, like simply interested in how you choose yeah, no, I mean, we're not, in, we're not necessarily interested in the nostalgia of old objects. Although, although, for some purposes, old objects might be an interesting starting point because they may, they, they may have a, a through uh, um, a wear and tear and patina or marks, they may have a richer history to mine. But, I, but I'm also very wary of this thing of, you know, nostalgia for the old. Yeah, I wasn't pointing at that. Yeah. Because there are often objects that are new that are, point, that are trying to reproduce effects of nostalgia. So yeah, sure. Really about that, I mean, if you were to take, let's say, as perception goes, something objectively, would a new series of family of objects interest you? Certainly, yes. The, the grid, you mean? Um, I'm not sure I can answer that in a good way, but I, 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 try, I, I attempted to answer the question in the lecture that, that you know, one take on the grid would be a sort of modernist take where you say that the, the grid is about abstraction and infinity and it suggests an ex extension beyond itself. I, mean, I think another take would be to say that the, the grid uh, focuses attention and frames things and that it can focus attention on the surface itself and while also acting as a, um, um, a visual reference for other types of geometries that sort of fleet on top of it or under it or so you usually do contrast aspects of, of what we want to focus on yeah i mean i could also give a more uh, subjective answer to the question which would be to say that um, uh, at the time when, when, when I was educated, grids were sort of taboo. They were, they were, they were not, uh, I mean, they were considered to be modernist period and for, therefore should be forgotten. <laughs> uh, so I think that uh, in, a, in our 
practice certainly, but I think also in 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 some of our, some of our uh, peers' practices, um, uh, we're interested in kind of. Um, picking up the grid again and see what it can do that's maybe different than the, the modernist idea of a grid. I also perhaps to round it off a little bit. I, I, um, I really enjoyed it and I think it's a wonderful um, portfolio of, of project that sort of seem to balance in a curious and also productive manner between a formal engagement <coughs> with architecture and, and a very playful way of learning about it. But, and in, in every sense, and I trust you, uh, you know this, I uh, think that um, this, this type of practice is you know, it's hugely valuable for an architect as a way of speculating and opening up onto sort of design opportunities and, and future project um, possibilities. Yet, I was wondering if you could also um, very briefly help us um, and reflect on the following. So right now you're in, at the moment where you won a research grant. And does that, does that mean that this needs to be formed, that the work needs to be formalized? in a different manner. Do you need to eventually report on outcomes and deliverables in a more stringent or I mean I see where you're going with this. Uh, uh, yes, but uh, but that that we have done all the time basically. And I think even if you do like even if, if you have a um, uh, practice that doesn't engage in academic research, let's say, but you're interested in reaching out to to a, to a, to a wider architecture community with the work, you, you still have to formalize the work. Like in order to be part of a biennial or triennial, you need to uh, conform to a format of a submission, and uh, so I, th I think that, or in order to publish work you need to formalize it as well. So I think that's a natural part of the process that you formalize work all the time, but you do it for different audiences. Sometimes it's a strictly academic audience and sometimes it's more um, uh, uh, practice oriented or speculative, let's say, or yeah. Um, well, before I thank you also, I'd like to remind that it's very nice that there are um, Quite a few alumni here tonight, and on Saturday at five o'clock there is the Catacomba, and it's a um, alumni initiated a few who are here um, event, and it's going to be great um, to hear the gathering of alumni with other alumni friends and guests um, speak about work. It's been a great since the initiation. With that, Daniel, um, thank you so much. Thank you, and please. <clears throat> you're, you're all welcome to drop by in our review tomorrow for the workshop at 2 p.m. in this space.